Welcome, Lauren. Hey, thanks for having me, Jeremy. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about what we started about early days of, of my entrepreneurial journey within Welltown and how early on we were involved with Visit Tulsa. I kind of want to start there uh, with, you said you worked there for three years. Yes. You recently just left though right. to start your own venture. We'll talk about that in a second. Cool. I would love to start maybe early Visit Tulsa. What were you a part of? What were the fun things that you were doing at the time? Lauren, uh, I'd love to hear your input there. All right, wow. Uh, so I started at Visit Tulsa in February of 2021, and it was so fast-tracked. I just made the decision to leave Gilcrease to take this opportunity, and we were getting ready for senior PGA at the time. Okay. I had maybe been on a golf course twice, so uh, there was a lot going on. Not only did we have that, but we were still holding a lot of different events. You know, we were getting out of the COVID pandemic. There were sure. a lot of other states that were still closed, but Oklahoma was open for business. Okay. So it was just a very busy time to be in Tulsa. Yeah. And what was your role at Visit Tulsa? I started as the marketing manager, but when I left, I was the director of communication. Okay. That's really cool. So you were hired as marketing Tulsa. Right. Uh, you hopped in. PJ was, was in town or coming to town. Mm -hmm. So you had to hop right in there. How do you sell Tulsa. How do you sell what we call home? Yeah, I think it really depends on your audience, who you're talking to. And so uh, from the start, whenever I came in, uh, we had our areas that we would sell to different people that we were talking to. So when we were gearing up for senior PGA, we were looking at what are the people who are coming to Tulsa for PGA going to want to do when they're not at Southern Hills. And uh, so a lot of the focus was on our food scene at okay. the time. Um, because that was before the Bob Dylan Center was open, but we were gearing up for that too. Sure. So food, you were selling food or you were focused on local restaurants or food trucks, like give me more there. Yeah. All right. So Tulsa has a really great dining scene. Uh, those of us who live here are fortunate enough to know. Um, and so I was just learning that year about the James Beard Foundation okay. and uh, all of their programs. So Tulsa, I think that year had five or six James Beard semifinalists. So we were just capitalizing on things that Tulsa was already getting national recognition for and uh, making sure that when people were in town that they would go and visit I those places. I love that, I love that. So early on, uh, I, when I think of someone trying to sell a city, let's say, cause that's what you're doing is selling Tulsa, trying to get more people here. And when I think about the organization that you are a part of, Visit Tulsa, we get hit up because of our location, because of proximity to BOK Center or whatever, about these big groups coming through. So Southern Hills, obvious being the PGA spot, but outside of that, a lot of these places are like, um, what's the big fish, the fishing one? Oh, Bassmaster. Yeah, the Bassmaster. Mm -hmm. So that's like right down the street. And whenever the NCAA basketball was here, um, there's schools trying to find different places to host their, uh, what do you call it? Whenever you're like, the oh, cheer, yeah. like the, when it was NCAA wrestling, they were looking for their host bars for the yeah, parties. Yeah, yeah, right. like having their, their pregame or whatever. So I find that interesting because how involved were you or Visit Tulsa as a whole in trying to sell Tulsa to these big conglomerates, to these big tournaments, to these NCAA or the Bassmaster? Like, obviously, you guys are big Very time involved, involved with these sort of things. How do you bait them to, to come to Tulsa? Yeah, well, again, it uh, is telling your audience exactly what they want to hear. So when it's NCAA, if we're going to bid for the NCAA wrestling championship, it's not only showing them we've got the facility, we've got the BOK Center that's been hosting the Big 12 wrestling championship for a long time now. I've already forgotten how many years. Um, so we can hold all of your fans. But then we also have things that your fans want to do. So for wrestlers, I'm not sure if you remember, we were begging all of the breweries to be fully stocked with beer and alcohol to make sure that we didn't right. have a situation in Detroit where they sold out of uh, beer around <laughs> the facility where they were having the tournament. Um, so it's showing the NCAA, hey, we have the BOK Center. We have hotels around the BOK Center where your fans can stay, where the athletes can stay. And then we also have an awesome dining scene and a brewery scene. And we've got these awesome museums that are around the area as well. Is there a tipping point? Is there a point of like, you're obviously bringing up lots of different aspects of why we have the venue, we have the hotels, we have the, is there a tipping point that you have seen with trying to pull in these, these, these bigger uh, tournaments or whatever that I'll, okay, that's it. That's why we're, we're coming to Tulsa. Is it, it could be a fan base. Like, was there one thing that people specifically focused in on or was it 
just the the variety i again it depends on who it was i think um there was it's tulsa is centrally located that is a major selling point um but tulsa has a lot of really unique cool things that stand out to different groups so we've got the bob dylan center that was you know very exciting for kind of the older crowd or people who are into music um but we also have the gathering place which is right. huge for families who want something that they can do with their kids uh in between different rounds of an event or things like that mm -hmm. so tulsa just really has something for everyone. I love it, I love it. So you were there for three years. What was your favorite project that you worked on? I was probably the visitor guide. Okay, D talk to me about what this entailed. Why Why was that so fun for you? Yeah, so uh, basically when I came in, we had a visitor guide that had been last produced in 2019, 2020. So right before the mm, pandemic started yeah. even because I don't think that guide, yes, it was pre-pandemic. So. I came in in 2021 and we needed to update this piece of literature so that we could use it to sell the town to bigger events that we wanted to bring in, but also so that people who were in town for different events could figure out what they wanted to do. Sure. And so we took what was, I think, 120 pages. And uh, after doing a lot of research and looking at what visitors wanted to have in a printed visitor guide, distilled it to 40 pages <laughs> and produced it quarterly. Wow. So it was wow. a lot, but it was so much fun. Yeah. So right now you have... Is it still, I'm assuming it's still continuing. Oh, yeah. Every quarter you guys are coming out with a new visitor guide. Yes. It was funny. I was, I can't remember. I think I was at the gathering place whenever this happened. I think you had a stack of them there or something for people to come oh, yeah. in and out, whatever. And I looked down and I saw, is that, is that well town? Is that Igloo Town? You guys, I don't know if you were instrumental in, in featuring Jeremy, Igloo Town. Jeremy, I chose that picture. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm like, that's super. I had no idea until I see it printed like people and i it tickled me so thank you for that by the way of course no and um the photographer it was damon's dronography they were amazing and uh they let us use their photo that's awesome yeah. that's awesome well uh yes it was it was uh something that happened this past winter as i was like wow that's how far in advance do you have to plan these like every quarter are you like six months ahead of time on on figuring this all out just out of curiosity like how much work and how long does it take you to put this together it is a labor of love and so Planning is the most important thing, but of course, uh, whenever you're trying to make a calendar, you have to wait until the very last minute to yeah. make sure it's as up to date as it can be before you go to print. So we started with a yearly editorial calendar for the visitor guide to make sure that we were representing the city well. You know, if you only have 40 pages, you really can't showcase everything. But our old 120 page visitor guide was not getting thumbed through by everyone. You know, people sure. would get intimidated, and not even read it. So the editorial calendar was to make sure that we were showcasing different restaurants, different areas of town, you know, giving everybody the love that they deserved because yeah. this town is so amazing. So we'd have that framework established at the beginning of the year. And then every quarter uh, we had a production calendar that we'd hit or at least try to, but um, we would publish it digitally you know, 24 hours after it had been finished and then send that to print and have it, you know, seven days later. In people's hands, like ASAP. Right. I would consider your job or your previous job to be one of which, like, you know of everything happening. Like, there's probably not something coming to town that you don't know of or at least aware of. Was there any moments of, like, you hearing news or, like, Oh my gosh, I need to go to this. Usually your events, Jeremy. Oh no. <laughs> no, seriously though, you're not just tooting my own, own uh, no. stroking ego here. You know, I have most of the annual events pretty much locked down. So I'm always telling my friends to come in That's town fun. for Oktoberfest and yeah. different things like that. But it, when it's your job to know what's going on in town, um, I took that very seriously. So That's I awesome. didn't get surprised by many things, but uh, there are so many events that are getting put together within two weeks of when the idea happens in this town. So um, there were definitely things going on that I didn't know about. Right, right, right. So as, as far as the big stuff, and, and I, I, I enjoy you saying well town events, but b b b I mean, top three things that you, Lauren, that you really enjoyed going to would be what per year, these annual things. They could be well town events, but if they weren't, what are they? Well, I already said Oktoberfest. I'm a huge fan, and that was not a Tulsa Regional Tourism event. Um, it was just one that we got to say was fantastic and everyone should go to. So Oktoberfest is my big one. But then uh, I am a big fan of the Great Raft Race. Okay. So I was sad. Are they bringing that back? They are bringing that okay, back. Okay, that's what I thought. I yes. heard, I've heard some stuff. 
Yeah. Good for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's going to be major. I'm very excited for that this Labor Day weekend, but it used to happen every Labor Day weekend uh, while I was in college. And uh, I look forward to making a raft whenever I can. So, so were you a part of making a raft in the, in previous years? No, we just okay. dreamed about it. Okay. Okay. Why the raft race out of curiosity? I think because it has such a unique history in this town, you know, it started in the seventies and, um, there was a very low barrier to entry. All you needed to do was, I think, maybe pay your registration and then put together something that floated okay. and then go down the river. Right. So you think the dam, everything that's happening over by the gathering place has a lot to do with this? With them bringing it, I, I don't know why they're bringing it back this year versus previous years. Yeah, I years. think so. I mean, um, there were a lot of different factors that led into why they had to stop it, like okay. the construction and COVID and things like that. So yeah, no, uh, it's a perfect way to celebrate the dam being finished is yeah. having the raft race back. I love it. I love that. That makes me really happy. So you said, I, I kind of want to take a step back. I know we've been talking a lot about Visit Tulsa. You were involved with Gilcrease. Yes. Uh, the Gilcrease Museum. How long were you at the museum? I was at Gilcrease for... Uh, Two, little over two years. Okay, okay. What did you do at, at the Gilcrease Museum? I was the communication coordinator and then bumped up to communication manager during COVID. So ran a lot of their social media, handled the Gilcrease magazine and it. communications around opening and closing during pandemic things. So as of right now, the Gilcrease Museum is closed. They've been closed for right. they closed a year, in year and a half? Summer of 2021 was when they closed, okay. 4th okay. of July. Okay, and was what is happening over there? A lot is happening over at Gilcrease. So even while I was there, they had been years deep in looking at narrative uh, structures and things like that, you know, telling the story of the collection that they have there. But now that they're closed, they are tearing down the old building. I think they've already torn it down and built a new structure. So the structure is going to have more exhibit space than the old building did. Mm. So it'll do a much better job of displaying this collection. I love the Gilcrease, like all that Osage Hills. Like I love all of that beautiful land up there. And I feel like the past couple of times I've been up there, a lot of people are taking photos or whatever. The big gardens, are they keeping the gardens like all around yeah. and just improving what's Absolutely. happening outside on the exterior of it? Yes. So they've saved all of the gardens that they can around okay. the building. So they've still got like Gilcrease's mausoleum out there and the Gilcrease house, which they just replaced the roof on that while I was there. So it's this beautiful copper roof. Um, and so all of that is maintained. And then I believe Stewart Park will reopen once the museum's back open. So uh, the new building will do a better job of connecting the the collection with the landscape in the Osage Hills. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like your role really organizations have changed, but essentially there's there's obviously a, a channel that you like to fall in. This communications, this this marketing channel of letting people know of what's happening, whether it's in Tulsa or at the Gilcrease Museum. Right. What early on in your life has caused you to fall in love? Like why that? out of everything, why why this ability to, uh, I don't know, shout it from the mountaintops, if you will, of, of something that's happening? That's a good question. Um, I always like to write, and so I think it was just a natural progression of how can I take the writing that I enjoy doing and make it something that's useful to the people around me? And so then that just naturally kind of led into, I was really interested in journalism for a long time. I wanted to be a journalist and uh, that's what I went into college with the intent of doing. But I don't know, something just pulled me more into being connected to your community in a different mm -hmm. way. And then I found myself at Gilcrease and fell in love with all of that. So you said journalism. So telling a story, you started with writing. And then uh, if you went through, you said you did go through journalism school. Is that what you graduated with then? Well, so I wanted to go to Mizzou for the longest okay. time and go to the J school at Mizzou. But okay. uh, when I was learning about student loans and things like that in <laughs> high school, it became clear that maybe I should go to the University of Tulsa, a little closer to home, um, who gave me a fantastic opportunity uh, to go there and study communications. So there were faculty there who had been journalists and could help me look at that. But, you know, the longer I stayed in Tulsa, uh, the more opportunities I saw to maybe branch out from journalism. And journalism writing specifically, uh, why do you find I, I can't stand writing, to be honest with you? OK, I am a, I'm more of a spoken like just case in point. I would much rather talk to you on the phone than shoot you a text. That's just, and I know that's just probably a, a really poor example, but I, I, I feel like I can communicate way faster 
just by speaking. Yeah, that's and very non-Gen Z. And then I know, I know, I'm fully, I'm old school. And then hang up the phone and be on to the next versus like tapping out, uh, I don't know, a, a small paragraph or whatever. So that's just my own personal thing. But uh, writing, would you, would you consider yourself a copywriter? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay so I'm assuming you're an r- avid reader then. Yes. Okay, so I, I guess this is a part of my mind that that's a little bit disconnected. Uh, journalism, I guess, is it within the world of journalism, uh, taking photos and attaching words to those photos? Is that typically, and again, this is so like, I don't even, is this typically the same person? So not only are you the one forming this story, but also visually you're putting this story together. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so there's a lot more of that. Um, but you could still have someone who's a writer. Like I worked with several journalists who came to town um, who brought a photographer with them. So there was just one person writing and one person I taking see. pictures. I see. I see. I didn't know if, if that visual attached with words was something that you really enjoyed or not. No, so I mean, that's where I, I was going with that. Do, yeah, I took one photography class and maybe if I spent more time on it, I'd be better. <laughs> but I've worked with so many talented photographers that it's hard to even consider, you know, getting yeah, into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have a girl, uh, Elise, in our office and it sounds like she took the Mizzou path. I'm pretty sure that's where she went to school and did copy, or she went to journalism school, but now she's our copywriter at Labor Division and she crushes it, but she also really enjoys taking photos. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if those kind of went hand in hand with like most journalism people, not only like writing, but also enjoy the photography. Maybe that just happens to be her case, whereas typically you would have a photographer um, and then you would write a story for them. Okay, enough of that. But just kind of curious. You're you're up to it sounds like a lot of things. What are you doing now? You just left left visit Tulsa. How long ago? I left in February, March. Okay, so recently. Yep. Now what? So now I'm freelancing. It was a crazy decision, but I had a couple opportunities present themselves at the beginning of the year, and after talking about it with my husband a lot, just kind of decided that maybe 2024 would be the year that I went freelance and chased a couple of my passion projects on the side. So what is that? What's a passion project to you? Wow, well, a passion project right now that is going way faster than I anticipated would be some work we're doing with the Council Oak Tree. Oh, nice. So it's I'm working with the Riverview Neighborhood Association and um, we've got some involvement from the Muskogee Creek Nation to try to uplift and promote the story of the Council Oak Tree and okay. also make sure it has lightning protection and things like that. How do you lightning? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> How do you lightning protect a tree? Um, you like, install, a, like you put up a rod, like yeah. right? Like in the middle of the tree to the side, like kind of to the side. And so right now the council Oak tree has like a lightning protection rod that was installed in the seventies and the tree has grown taller than that lightning protection rod. So yeah, we have uh, people who are way more intelligent than I am regarding electrician stuff and trees who are working on that. Um, But yeah. Is this out of curiosity, is this tree insured? I don't think it is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Guys, I was just thinking how important this thing is. Right. Uh, I would figure like, ah, they're going out and doing all this protection type stuff with obviously the, the natural elements. I don't know if that was a, a aspect of that. So you're writing, or is there a, is there a pamphlet? Is there a digital? Like, what are you writing about? Um, in order to t- tell the story, help tell the story of the yeah, Council so Oak. Related to what we're doing is trying to start our own website. So get off of the Riverview Neighborhood Association website and set up some things there. Uh, so it's a little more than just writing right now and also logistical things and um, just having conversations that need to be had uh, about, you know, logistical things uh, related to the tree. But yeah, then eventually we really want to have a nice website that showcases the history of the tree. Um, I've already found a bunch of articles from the Tulsa world that they have up from the 90s uh, that tell some neat stories about the tree. So yeah, just kind of organizing, cataloging, and then connecting the story that way. I love it. You said this is a kind of a passion project for you. Is is that just because you enjoy writing about this sort of stuff or is it the council logo, like the story, like every, does that really matter to you? Yeah, Tulsa really matters to me. (laughs) Um, I'm from here. I grew up here. And so making sure that the story of the city is told is really important to me. And so the tree was something that I didn't know much about until I started at Visit Tulsa. You know, I think Mm. we talked about it at Gilcrease and about how the city was founded. But um, once I got to visit Tulsa and started to have to tell people what they could do when Gilcrease was closed and how they could learn about Tulsa's history Mm -hmm. and our indigenous history, I'd tell them to go and check out the tree. But then I'd hear reports back that 
maybe there could be more information about the tree to contextualize that experience. Mm -hmm. So loving Tulsa, loving everything about Tulsa, and maybe especially the history of Tulsa has led you to this, like, this is a really cool piece. Not only I want uh, to know more about, but I want others to know about, which has led you to writing. Yeah. So passion projects, small freelance uh, work. Is there anything that would be like, obviously you're following this path. Was there, is there anything kind of like a, a big goal that you have in mind in the freelance world? Oh, I'm not sure. Um, I really, part of the reason why I made the decision that I did this year was because I felt like I had hit a lot of the goals that I had okay. for myself, at least the goals that I had wanted to hit by the time I was 30. And I was trying to figure out what next. Um, and so in looking at that and thinking about what I could do next, you know, getting my APR, maybe my accreditation in public relations or going to grad school, uh, I wanted to also, I don't know, just have more time and freedom to explore those things and projects that I wanted to do while we were living in Tulsa, just in yeah. case in 10 years, I'm not living here anymore. So yeah, that's ultimately what led me to go freelance. You were, you were born and raised here though, right? So I was born in Annapolis, okay, but okay. I've lived here since I was three years old. Okay, close enough. Yeah. Where did you go to high school? I went to Jinx. Okay, nice, nice. And then you went to TU. Right. So you've been in the Tulsa area for quite some time now. Yes. It sounds like you have a lot of, a lot of love for this city. Mm -hmm. What are the things I, we often, and, and I've, I've, I've talked to a lot of different individuals that talk about what's the good things some of the positive aspects. What are the things, in your opinion, that Tulsa does not do right? Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here and maybe give it a little second to think about it. I feel like we're an amazing city in a lot of ways, but but what are the things that we're not good at? Yes. Okay. So one is our appreciation of public transportation. Oh, so okay. I think our city has done a really good job to establish and build up what we have. And there's a lot of good work going on at Metrolink Tulsa right now. They just rebranded. And I love taking the Aerobus um, okay. from my house in Midtown downtown. You actively do this currently? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's great. And that is the response yeah. that I'm telling you. I yeah. wish more people in yeah. our town would take advantage of public transportation sure. when they can. But it's not easily accessible for a lot of people. I'm lucky that I live on the Aerobus line. When is Tulsa getting a trolley? Exactly. Like, like an electric trolley <laughs> like OKC just got. I know. Is this in the work? Oh. Do you know about this? I, if it is, I don't know about okay, it. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. <laughs> Ideally, like I'm so jealous when I see OKC getting this, this, uh, like, I don't know. There's something about like, we should be connecting. I'm going to get on my soapbox for a second. We should be connecting Cherry Street, Brookside and downtown. That feels like a very natural thing where they should do a loop. Uh, they should carve out part of Peoria or like wherever they take this thing. Why are they not doing this? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But again, yeah. uh, maybe a conversation with Jeep. But what you described does exist. The Aerolink does connect Brookside to Cherry Street mm -hmm. to downtown. So on St. Patrick's Day, I was able to leave my house near Brookside and okay. then catch the bus, go to Cherry Street and then catch the bus again and go downtown, you know, and it's like two bucks for a day. So bus. I am a huge fan of public transit. Mm -hmm. I have myself rode um, the Arrow. Um, I love the way that they've redone the Peoria stops. Yeah. The problem that I've always had is it's reading the map, reading the times. It's very confusing at times. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the 21st and 15th, there's bus that run this way and there's buses. So I guess when I think of a loop, it's a hop on, hop off type of situation. Whereas you don't have to necessarily pre-navigate two, three buses. Does that make sense ahead of time? Because obviously with the cross streets, you're going to get one bus going this way. And then, so I get that. It's just, I wish there was a better way to keep track. And maybe there is, is there an app that gives you exact locations? They of do. Yeah. It, some of it, maybe I haven't quite figured it out, but okay. I did have some difficulties on St. Patrick's. Day. I knew it. See? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not saying you're wrong. <laughs> no, but as a whole. So let's go back to the Tulsa question. Mm -hmm. Public transit. I definitely think we can do it, things yes. better. Yeah. The bike lane situation has gotten way better. Mm -hmm. Love that. Oh, Are yeah. you an avid cyclist? You know, I use the This Machine bikes when I can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. And between that and public or the, the arrow, is there anything else that we could be doing better on the on the transit side? On the transit. Uh, yeah. I mean, a trolley would be really great. Yeah. Um, I've heard that they're going to start an 11th street route. So really? okay. maybe once that gets going, okay. um, 
Yeah, I, th I think Tulsa, uh, in most things, most of my issues, not that I have a lot of issues, but is really moving in the right direction okay. on those things. Okay. Yeah. Anything else that we, you think Tulsa should do better? Embracing the story, you know, of Tulsa, understanding our history. Yeah. So, which, again, is moving in the right direction, and there are people who are getting invested and involved. Uh, we have a lot of newcomers, you know, to Tulsa, which is fantastic. And so I just encourage everyone who's coming here to learn about the history like there's been lots of things going on here one thing that comes to mind as we're talking here is what you're saying is telling our story i think on a global definitely national stage i'm i'm thinking of killers of the flower moon of these these big hollywood productions that come locally to film and help tell the story of not only tulsa but obviously with 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 the different nations or getting involved with kind of this area as a whole and help uh, obviously this is this is good things this is yeah. help telling history uh, i feel like there's a lot of things locally that we could be telling stories and it sounds like you're doing that with with the council oak tree and kind of the the, the small bits of of raising up its own um website but i think that whenever we go and try to convince people to come to Tulsa, whether it's a tournament or whether it's people to move through Tulsa remote. I think a history, I couldn't agree more, a, the, the history of this place, good or bad, helps tell the Tulsa story and Absolutely. helps tell where we are today. In, in storytelling, have you, from your time at Visit Tulsa, found that, I don't know, the impact of these stories they have on outsiders, whether they're just here to visit or whether they're here to stay? Yes. it. You can see the impact that these stories have on people. Uh, I mean, there are folks who, not trips that I was related to, but who had come into town to learn more about Greenwood and learned about their ancestors who lived there. I mean, I think it was on uh, Channel 6 or Channel 2. Like NBC had sure. a host out here who learned about one of her ancestors and um, just seeing those powerful stories resonate with people. Um, you know, there's stories that not everybody who grew up here knew happened. So yeah, I mean, like you can look at Lily Gladstone. Uh, she's amazing. And I had the opportunity to meet her last fall. And so she's not Osage, but uh, the Osage tribe has a lot of respect for her because she worked so closely with them during filming of Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah. And so you know, uh, the Osage story and what happened isn't her story, but she is a huge, you know, proponent um, for preserving that story and telling that story and, uh, you know, making sure that people know that that happened and impacts still happen here. So you were at Visit Tulsa whenever the movie was released. Did you guys get any data on what this uh, awareness, let's call it, what this brought to Tulsa? Oh, gosh, I've forgotten the number because we did that a lot. But yeah, we had like thousands of headlines you know Tulsa and Oklahoma were making like global headlines not yeah. only for the movie and the story that was being told but then as a film destination so that helps you know get productions like Twisters 2 back out here yeah, yeah. and it you know helps light a fire for people like Sterling Harjo to continue doing awesome work here so yeah it had a huge effect on the city that's so cool that's so cool um okay I I uh I, I want to talk about food you mentioned restaurants yes. a, a lot. Uh, would you consider yourself a foodie? You know, I don't like when people call themselves foodies. Really? But yeah. Why, why, why do you why do you do not like that term foodie or maybe <laughs> uh, snub your nose? At? I don't I know. Think, what. Why? Why yeah, is foodie a, not a good word? It just seems a little snobby sometimes. <laughs> Isn't that what it is? <laughs> is it a little food snobbery? Yeah. So yeah, I am, I guess, a picky eater. Okay. Like I only like eating food that's really good. Okay. So if I pick up a taco and it's not delicious, I'm probably not going to finish it. <laughs> Just a taco, though. Just a taco. What are your favorite restaurants in town? All right. Cicero's. Uh, I love that place. So I'm like looking at them. Yeah, right exactly. Now. Right. Right down the street here. So yeah. good. Yeah. Um, uh, T Don's Tacos Don Francisco. They were always there for me in college. So um, but Lone Wolf was also always yeah. there for me during college. So yeah. I love seeing all of the growth that they've had. Chicken and the Wolf. Um, and then, oh, yeah. Lana Thai for spicy food. Lana Thai. Is that the 71st Street? 
Yes. No. Is that 71st and Memorial mm -hmm. area right there? Yeah. Why Lana? Have you been to Tropical? I have. Okay. Yeah. You think Lana is better than Tropical? It depends. If I want red gang curry, I'm going to go to Tropical. But okay. if I want cashew chicken, I'm going to go to Lana Thai. Wow. You know your food. Oh, thanks. Do you <laughs> <laughs> You're like, thank you. It was my job. I, wor I worked really hard. Where were you encouraging people to go? Like you just named off a couple really great local spots. Where were you like, you need to go X? Towards the end, I was telling a lot of people that they need to go to Prism Cafe. They just opened up recently and they're so good. Prism? Yeah. Why haven't I not heard about this? I don't where know. They, you where, can where, almost see them from here. They're, uh, they're north. Me. North of downtown, okay. like on Denver. Um, okay. And I think they're calling that the Heights District. So You know what? I know exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's off of Latimer. Yes. Is it Latimer? Yeah, it is. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. I know. I do know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Are they relatively new? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Why Prism? It's just the vibe is so cute. Uh, and the food's amazing. First, the food's amazing. If the food wasn't amazing, I wouldn't be telling What's you What's your go-to go go Prism meal? Oh, it changes every time. Okay. Because I went for dinner once and I, I think I had like a braised short rib something and it was amazing. But then there are other times I'll go for like a bagel. So. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Nice. They, they're you know, so hyper local is what they call it. Um, so she changes the menu based on what she has available. So the oh, first cool. time I went, it was because she had a friend in town and they collaborated on, um, oh, Pad Caprao, which is like what a, is that? it's a Thai dish actually. Okay. We first had it at Lana Thai. Um, but it's like Thai basil is kind of the main element of that. So when Thai basil was in season and she had a lot of it, uh, they had a Pad Caprao pop-up day. Wow. Yeah. And, and their prism, you say she, what was the chef's? Oh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. We don't have to go into, um, they specialize in hyper, you said the word hyper local, mm -hmm. which in definition, let me take a stab at this is I would assume locally sourced ingredients. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Like whatever you can put your hands on is what is kind of like farm. Is it? Oh, farm bar. Farm bar. That's another one farm I bar. would say. Yeah. 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 That place is awesome too. Okay. Man, you got me. I mean, so have me you been to Farm Bar's here. Burger Night? I have not. Oh, that's so I'm good. aware of it. Yeah. I, I have not. How is that any different? And please, uh, uh, back in the day, it was McNelly's Wednesday nights. It was their, their Burger Night. Yeah. And you go, I, th I want to say it was two ninety nine back in the day. It was th a $3 burger. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's crazy talk. But it's like a $5 burger now or something like that, isn't it? Uh -huh. How is that better? How is she, I'm getting heads nodding. Uh, how is that better? How, sorry, how is Farm Bar better than the classic McNally's? And McNally's. Well, it's different because McNally's is awesome, you know? Okay, sure. But I think McNally's and Farm Bar are two different experiences. So you go to McNally's and you've got your burger that's super, super affordable. Um, and you get your beers and you hang out with your friends on a Wednesday night. So Farm Bar offers that same. It's on Tuesdays, so still a weeknight escape. Um, but they pair their burger with um, like a, Barbera, I think, is the wine. So it's like a oh, red wine. Okay. So you know, at McNally's it's burgers and beer, but at Farm Bar it's burgers and wine. And okay, I can already tell this is a debate because <laughs> I already have a side here. Whether you would have a hamburger with wine or a hamburger with beer, you're mentioning both. What's your personal favorite, Lauren? I'm a wine girl, so get out of here. It's the wine. Yeah. Where are we right now? I know. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm you. Just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yeah. So you like a nice red with uh, with a burger? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like a nice pilsner with with a burger. Right. Personal preference here. Okay. So we talked about that. Uh, I I do have. You had mentioned walking in. You hope you're not over caffeinated. Right. It sounds like you might like coffee. We've talked about food. Now let's talk about coffee. What's your favorite coffee? Uh, I drink my coffee black, so I just okay. like a good bean ideally sourced from costa rica and that was roasted recently <laughs> so you said a lot right there that leads me to believe you're also a coffee snob you have to have beans sourced from a specific region in south america you just like it black which tells me you probably do like your coffee would you consider yourself a coffee coffee snob as well yeah but i'll own up to that because my parents owned a coffee shop when okay. i was a kid okay so <laughs> so who serves the best black coffee other than obviously sourcing it and doing right. whatever Importing you do at home. Beans myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Other than that, where would you say is, is a great spot? I Tulsa has an amazing coffee scene. So shades of Brown is my favorite because I can walk there from my house. So when Classic. I'm out of beans, I can go there yeah, and get more, but 
Topeka is really great. I really love their porch session whenever it's cold brewed. It's so good. Um, and oh gosh, Coffee House on Cherry Street is fun. I think when I leave my house for coffee, I also take the environment into consideration. Okay. So yeah, yeah, those Let's three. get nerdy for a second. Who has the best coffee environment, coffee shop environment? Is that what you're talking about? Like when you go somewhere, not only it's it's the cup that's in front of you, but it's the vibes around you. Mm -hmm. Gypsy is my favorite coffee shop Gypsy. environment. Gypsy, okay. Why Gypsy? I really love just that like, bohemian type there's tapestries hanging on the wall and incense burning somewhere they've always got events going on so that's a fun place for me to go and just you know be consumed with the things that are outside of my head for a little bit so yeah they're wow fun. okay that's cool all right last but not least and we'll just wrap it up with this just because of where we're at right now welltown cannot be a part of this answer you have a very prominent shirt on. Oh, yeah. That Tulsa Beers from Mythic. Those guys are great. Mm -hmm. Where would you say your favorite like place to go, not only to drink beer, so maybe your favorite beer in town, but also to aesthetically pleasing spot to go? Nothing's Left does a really good job. Um, I'm a really big sour beer girl. Yep. So, yeah, I yep. love them. Yeah. So nothing's left for both beer and aesthetics. Oh, yeah. That new edition they opened up in the back with all those neon lights and things. It's fantastic. It's very cool. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. Thank you, Lauren, so much for being on the podcast. Yeah, of course. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to talk about before we end here? Uh, we, hit a, we hit on a little bit of your history, uh, obviously what you're up to now. Food scene, the coffee scene, a little bit of the beer scene. Yeah. Anything else? In preparation for this question, I was like, let's remind people there's a mayoral election. So, oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah, lots of good candidates. Everyone should do their research. It's a good okay. time to support right. our city with a vote. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being on the pod. Of course. Thank you for having me.